We play an ugly game. You have the determination to win it. History does not remember blood. It remembers names. Matt, I'm putting you on the spot. In 10 seconds, how many dragons from this series can you name? Braxes, Tyrax, Tyraxes, uh, Valerian, but he's dead. Um, Vagar. That's more than me. I yeah. forgot. <laughs> that was all. really good. I can't even name my children, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had bets out there. They said three, and you got six. That's good. Enough. It's not bad, is it? I might have added one on. So I'm going to ask Thank another you. really um, fluffy question to get things started. Great, love it. The two of you could have a hair off. You both have great hair in this. Now I notice you have more of a blunt cut, you have more of a bob, it's more neat. Yeah. Yours is wilder, you have a man pony happening. I'm wondering if this reflects your characters in any way, and who do you think has the better wig? I've got a beautiful, gorgeous wig. My his wig is, was made from the same. more expensive. I had the most expensive wig on the show. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's because he's the king. Fact, yeah. facts. But really? I've got more styles, haven't I? I think, well, well, well I've got some beautiful yeah. styles, man. Let's, <laughs> yours, not, yours let's is, not go into that. <laughs> so it's react. It's because, anyway, I don't want to give it away. I don't know who just won. Me? No <laughs> way. I've got, I've got My, the I was the only one with the same hair palette as Daenerys. Oh. It was taken from her colours. Really? And it's all about how it matches your skin tone. It's quite a considered thing, all joking aside, your, your, your hair. Because some sort of, like, like tones of it, they look green against your skin and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's not just like the lob a big blonde wig on your head. Who do you think you're talking to? You're talking to an LA girl that highlights her hair every month. I was going to say, that's not a wig, days. is it? That's real hair, isn't it? <laughs> I wanted to ask you about riding the mechanical bull, so to speak. Oh, yeah. Which is riding a dragon. Yeah. If we were to have like a hidden camera on you, yeah, and show the behind the scenes of what that actually looked like, can you break it down for us? I heard there's like leaf blowers, like blowing wind. Yeah, I mean not leaf blowers. Got great. Yeah, yeah, I've got some memories going at you. They've got great big wind machines like this, rain the lot, and you're up on a plinth, which is about twenty foot in the air. Then they strap you in, and then you can't get down. You're just up there all day, and uh, and then they sort of move you around on a on like a remote control mechanical bull. Did your skills get better over the season? No, not really. I was born to do it. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I like it's that. Easy. Cockiness. Yeah. Who really deserves the throne? Beginning of season one, who do we really think deserves the throne? Him. Me. Him. Well, the heir. I'm sorry. The heir to the Me. throne. Why? That was a real Beetlejuice moment. Me. <laughs> Me. I do. I do deserve it. By rights. No, he's he's he has a right he has a right to it. Yeah, and you nick it off me. Yeah, you did. You but stole there's no way it. there's no way in the seven hells that I'm going to name him heir. He's yeah, too irresponsible. What, you don't know how I'd react to that. Oh, you, you, you know what I mean. Every job he's had, he's balls <laughs> up. He's made an absolute mess of. There's no way. The question is, has he done it on purpose, or has he just balls me up? No, I didn't do it to hurt you or anything like that. I think that I might, I. What I my duty is king. I even say I actually don't think that Damon wants to be king. No, I don't. You know the councils say you know they think that he's got designs on it, and I'm like he doesn't want to be king. He wouldn't. He could not sit in that he council room up. without. He wouldn't. He, he wouldn't turn He'd up. He'd never be there. He's afraid of commitment. Yeah. That's what it is. Something like that. I think so. Wow. He'd be out on the merry. George has sort of said there's nobody really good or evil. No. Like Game of Thrones, there's good and evil. But who do you think is the most evil and the most good in season one? Who do you truly think? And a lot of people have been naming you as, as the, the most, most good. good. Well, I am, yeah. <laughs> and who have they been naming as the most evil? Otto. Otto. Yeah. Yeah, I'd go with Otto. Do you agree? Yeah. Because he's the most Machiavellian. He's the most serpent. He is, yeah. He's the puppet master. Yeah. Which is why Damon, and he says, look, I see him for what he is. He's a puppet master. He's got you like this. Yeah. George said real quick, that the biggest conflict in this show is not between people, but within somebody's own heart. What do you think each of your characters' biggest conflict in their heart is? I'm, I'm ending things on a very deep note. Deep one, yeah. My biggest conflict, I should never have been named king. Oh, that's a tough one. Why? 
because really in my heart I wasn't built to do it. I don't know, really. it's a tough one. His biggest conflict is himself, to be honest. And, uh, and his brother, There's something to do with his brother, probably. God. I don't know what. It's because he should never have been king. His brother, well, exactly, <laughs> exactly, it's probably true. He said it himself. I've inherited your conflict. Yeah, yeah. Bastard. If Rhaenyra comes into power, she could cut off any challenge to her succession. I am to inherit the Iron Throne. She will block my way. So first of all, I heard that when you two met for the first time, that you instantly were like in love. Like was that so? Was that sort of you're nodding your head, Olivia? Like mm. yes. Sort of. How was that first meeting uh, between the two of you? Lovely and a relief as well. Such a relief. Yeah. We're just like, oh, we've yeah. Home. Yeah, we've got this. Yeah, we've got each other. Yeah. We. I mean. What lucky actually because it's just, you know it's that rare thing oh, yeah. where you meet someone and there's like an immediate understanding and familiarity and that's quite unusual and yeah it is deeply grateful for it and a lot of the time on these jobs you're you're thrown together and you know you're, you're expected to have this intense yeah. chemistry and that's something that as actors all the time we have to work on yeah and so it's such a treat when it's just like that okay yeah, yeah. see you yeah know yeah you. oh good love good. you all right chill yeah. However, would you think Ryan was nervous when he saw how well you got on? Because later on, they're sort of divided. I hope he was nervous. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. W well, but I mean, crucially, this story is like th that connection and that chemistry is is sort of fundamental yeah. to anything that happens later. And and ultimately, you have two people who desperately want that reunification, mm. won't ask for it, but so that. That, love, that we like yeah. each other, it's really handy. Actually. Yeah, that love has to be cemented already right. to then f hate each other. And that's where the pain is. Yeah. Yeah. Without the love, the pain doesn't work. Right. So. Yeah. Emma, for you, I want you to juxtapose for me because I heard about your audition that your phone was propped up on a chip bag oh, and yeah. that you sort of had to makeshift some hair extensions. Yeah. <laughs> so juxtapose that from the first time you stepped on the set, full wig, yeah. full like 2,000 crew and cast. Yeah. How big a difference were those two worlds? Um, I mean, like, I don't even really have language to describe that. Added to which, we come into this on the back of a pandemic where I haven't seen anyone in two years. Uh, I mean, like different worlds. Mm. And uh, certainly initially, I felt like I'd won a, I felt like I'd won a competition. And that someone had, no, no, but like, it's very weird to be plucked out your living room, right? Yeah, Because it's true. also like, you know, so little during a pandemic we could be an in-person. Yeah. So, so again, there's something very surreal about mm. going from, yeah, like, doing tapes in your bedroom to arriving on set with 2,000 people, you know, yeah. whatever it is, 600 people. Um, and then, of course, in like no time, it becomes wonderfully familiar. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's, you know, very that's normal. the joy of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. boring. Yeah. I'm bored. Oh, I'm bored now. <laughs> Untrue. So I, I know that you hadn't watched Game of Thrones before you were cast. So then how did you infuse it? Did you binge, like when you got the role, did you just like go hard? And yeah. what were your thoughts? So. I'm so glad I hadn't watched Game of Thrones before I auditioned because I think if I had the feelings towards Game of Thrones that I have now, I wouldn't have gotten the role because I love it so much and I think it's so incredible. And our director, showrunner, Miguel Sapochnik, he who directed episodes like Hard Home and Battle of the Bastards and he's just incredible, he's the one that has like shaped this um, The House of the Dragon. So, it, it, you know, that was one of our biggest... <coughs> um, I say that was one of our biggest turns turn ons. To, that was one of our uh, that was one of the things that was in. in I in, was turned on. I was turned on. Yeah. <laughs> we all turned on. Yeah. That was one of the things that made us want to do the job, you know, from from the get go. Um, what was the question? I'm so sorry. No, no, no. You answered it. Did I? Oh, good, good. But I, yeah, I can. I get turned on watching the show, and I don't know if that's good or bad. But I mean, it's, <laughs> a, it's a sexy happens. show. It's a sexy show. It's a sexy it's show. It's just a reality. <laughs> yeah, it's a sexy show. Um, it's visceral. It's in your face. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, but no, loved it. And my, me and my mum binged it together, and she's on my same like Now TV account, which is what um, <laughs> Thrones is on in the UK. And she would be like four or five ahead of me, and so I'd just click on it and be like, "What's going on?" And then something would happen. No, I'd be no, like, no, "No, no, no!" And I'd be like, oh. <laughs> "I'm wondering for the two of you because you have very your characters have very different relationships with their father." And I think maybe it changes, it's sort of part of maybe the reason why they end up conflicted with each other. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how you think those relationships differ? Yeah, I mean, so for Rhaenyra, like she adores her dad. 
And he sort of, and he adores her. And simultaneously, they share a stubbornness. That means they just can't communicate. I think there is like a really genuine love there. And I, I don't think uh, you talk often about Otto b making a pawn of Alison. I think that's true with Viserys. No. And yet, you somehow he completely isolates her by not being able to to communicate. And she wants his sort of adoration mm. more than anyone and can't ask for it. So they're at an impasse. Whereas you kind of, you're, you do talk. Yeah, I feel like for me, like you've been granted maybe too much freedom yeah. where you'd love some boundaries yeah, right. set. And whereas my relationship with my dad, it's, in, it's been imposed upon yeah. me that I will live a life of servitude, you know? Deeply restricted. Yeah. Yeah. Your characters have been compared to Cersei and Arya. Do you think it's a fair comparison? Because I feel like with your character, she was sort of portrayed as a pure villain from the narrative in the book, but maybe that we'll see a different side, but do you think those are fair comparisons? Yeah, I mean, in terms of like archetypes, for sure, but they do feel very different yeah. as well. And the beauty of Game of Thrones is that one minute you love these characters mm. and the next you absolutely despise them. And I don't think that's that different for us. No. And like, if anything, what I would hope is that House of the Dragon has really, really worked to make sure that like, as in life, you don't have like goodies and baddies everyone's a mix and kind of that's what makes life so threatening i think mm. do you think the realm will ever accept me as their queen the lords of the realm bent the knee a woman would not inherit the iron throne because that is the order of things so first of all congratulations on this series ryan i wonder if you felt a little bit like you sat on the iron throne yourself when george r r martin named you king of this empire it, that's that's a really good metaphor. I think it I think it felt very much like that. And then uh, I was <laughs> I was wondering if that meant that uh, sitting there meant that um, everybody was then going to try to kill me. <laughs> it, that's an interesting. I'm not going to even say anything to that, other than the fact that what was that? Because I knew you had a lunch with George R. R. Martin, where you sat down and it was the next day that your agent got that call saying, you know, George has a job for you. What did you say to him in that lunch? What happened behind the scenes that you had such a kinship with him? It, it was well, we had we had developed a relationship over a few years, just as uh, just as me as a fan, I got I got to know him, and we became we became friendly, and it was just it was just nice. I mean, he had, he was hugely influential on me as a writer, and I was just a big fan of his. So I I never expected anything out of the relationship at all, and I honestly thought I was just going out for a beer with him, and he uh, he had he had come in with an agenda. <laughs> And that was to, uh, wow. to to try to get me to to write this pilot, which of course I I, I leapt at the chance. And it really, I mean, it it came together in such it, things in this town did not fall out of the sky like that ever, especially good jobs. Uh, so it was just it was I'm still stunned by how it, how it all happened. But uh, it felt uh, you know it felt like a bit of um, like Daenerys seeing the uh, you know seeing the red comet in in the sky. It was a prophecy, of things to come. Miguel, they had to drag you back kicking and screaming from what I heard. After 11 weeks of night shoots on Game of Thrones, you're an Emmy winner, though, for, you know, for your work on that show. One thing that I think fans are really excited about is 17 Dragons. I know we don't even see them all in season one, but sort of can, tell me sort of what went into, how do you decide what dragons are going to have what personalities? How much fun is that? And they look, from what I've seen in episode one, spectacular. Thank you. The, the, the dragon process was really it, I think we spent over a year designing 13 of the dragons um, and uh, and it was really interesting we learned a lot about dragons we had to figure out things like um, why dragons die for example you know what kills a dragon because it seems to be that uh, that we there was certain mythology that hadn't been kind of filled out uh, by George so it was quite kind of quite fun to kind of look for the pieces and try and figure out how do we how do we tell a story so that if we retrofit our designs into this uh, uh, mythology about dragons um, and then there was the reality of like you know you can design a dragon all you want and then you give it to these guys called the riggers and the riggers basically take your dragon design they break it down build a skeleton put the muscles on it and then try and figure out why it doesn't fly um, and so there was a lot of, you know, Caraxes, which is uh, the blood worm, which is Damon's dragon, is a dragon that's super long. He's basically a deformed dragon. We call him the elephant man. And um, 
Uh, and the, the funny thing about Caraxes is Caraxes really shouldn't fly because his body's too long for aero, any aerodynamics to work properly. And so it was going back and saying, oh, we've got to put little kind of wings in his hind legs for this to actually work. That kind of stuff is pretty fun to do, um, but they're not real. You know that, right? What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, I won't, I, won't, I won't spoil it for you. I think I might cry. How could you do this to me? <laughs> um, Ryan, I, I can't even imagine. I know you're a prop collector. You even have a podcast about movie paraphernalia. So I'm wondering for you, working on the Iron Throne, some of the incredible daggers, and this is also the height of the Targaryen dynasty. Can you talk about from the scope of it to the big things to like those little details, kind of the undertaking of this project and how do you make sure it fits in with what we're going to see 200 years later when we see familiar sets yeah i mean i think that that's the, that's the great fun of doing doing something like this where the entire world is bespoke or custom you know it, everything has to be built and constructed and it's all done with a purpose and a design behind it and you get all of these wonderful artisans from all corners who, who are the, their entire focus is creating this this little piece of parchment or this dragon's egg or how do we how dragon's eggs need to be kept warm how do we keep them warm there should be a carrier there should be some kind of kiln to carry it around in and you get all of this creativity that comes to you from from the outside just based on people wanting to make the world feel like a real place that's lived in and you get to see all of these you know Jim Clay our production designer said something really interesting to me when we were at, right at the outset he said the, the film business in general just employs all of these these crafts that would otherwise be extinct you, you know clay sculptors and plasterers and yes you could you could do that as an art form on the side or have a little etsy shop but in terms of it being a reliable career and a and a, and a trade to 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 learn and study and 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 grow in and have some kind of uh career path for you it's really the, a lot of those handmade old old things that we used to do before machines took over everything are employed by the film industry and you and you get artists that that pursue that um so just uh, that's one of the joys for me is because i can't do i have i have one life skill <laughs> and if anybody ever if, if ai takes over writing i'm really screwed because i can't do anything else uh, miguel is very talented he can draw he's good at music i've i've i, do, I can do one thing so um so just for me just getting to watch all of those those people do their job is one of the greatest joys of my job the rap and be but real quick uh if i'm going to be a, a prophet for a second i think you guys have said you already know how this is going to end approximately how many seasons the baratheons and the starks are teased in in you know one of the teasers and then we expect kills from game of thrones is that mapped out in your brains or is a lot of it still in flux until i know the books have been written but in terms of how it's all going to play out we have a plan <laughs> It's only one season long, sorry, I've got to tell you now. It's just like it's over after one season. We're going to have like two episodes next season, but they'll be extremely long, about five hours each, and that's going to be it. No, we, we do we do, we do do have a plan. I mean, the beautiful thing is that the, the dynasty is has, you know, 100 years left in it, even after, even after the, the Dance of the Dragon. So there's, um, uh, there's plenty of places to go kind of before and after, but this story has, has a defined length to it simply because of how bloody it is. Um, and we have, we kind of have that in our head, but I think, I think the hope is that there'll be an appetite for more Targaryen tales. Cause I think it's interesting to, to, to go backwards and forwards in time and tell tales from, you know, before, before they, before the conquest and then possibly a time when they were in power, but with no dragons. I think there's a lot of interesting uh, themes and landscapes to explore within that uh, 300 year dynasty. Well, who else would have a claim? The firstborn child, Rhaenyra. No queen has ever sat the Iron Throne. The king has an heir, Daemon Targaryen. I will not be made to choose between my brother and my daughter. Okay, first I have to ask you. Yes. You have a joust, yes. and then you have a flirt. Yes. Who flirts after they joust? Christmas Cole. Christmas Cole. Christmas Cole. Christmas Cole. Christmas Cole. Christmas Cole. Christmas Christmas came early. Uh, Christmas came early, yeah. Christmas came uh, uh, cool. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how he did that. Yeah, it was weird thinking about it. I don't know that I would have the energy to kind of go I and I think that it's a move because it's like, it's like I just thing. beat your like just, uncle. So. Yeah, in yes. this fight. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and the, uh, he's the best. And he's the best. So. I mean, uh, Damon, yeah. Damon. And it was just so easy. 
W- uh, w- the fight? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that's what I'm saying. Like, oh, it's yeah, just like, yeah, it was yeah. so easy. I have, to, yeah. I have energy to now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I guess so. Yeah, it wasn't easy for me at all. No. <laughs> I was exhausted. Were you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tell me about it. It was, well, it's, it, you're throwing a, a, a ball with this sticks on it, on a chain. It's kind of made of plastic, but it f- still kind of. It's got weight to it. It's so got it weight has to, to it move. so that it does a thing. And also it rebounds off the shield. And I, I and, you know, I don't want to go into too much detail, but there are areas uh, in which you don't want uh, a ball with spikes to rebound and hit. No. So a lot of it was kind of, did, like, you're, you're really good with your, you're really good with your hips. hips. Uh, uh, so I did a lot of hip, a lot of hip work. Your lot of hip action. Yeah. Riding dragons more difficult? Are you like are you? Mm. Oh nice. no, actually, no, so easy. much easier. Oh, it is. Yeah. Okay, mate, you just kind of like propped up on this like basically like a uh, like saddle, and they just kind of move you around. That's it. I didn't yeah. have to do. I didn't have to train like Fab had to train and everything. No, no actually, quite simple. I asked but Matt. You just have to do high valerian. I just have to do high valerian, so, yeah. which is okay. So that balances it out. You asked Matt. I asked Matt, like, if there was, like, a hidden camera on each of you riding a dragon, like, who, like, what would it look like? Would you look ridiculous? Because there's yeah. a leaf blower. I mean, I, I, it's, it's quite easy for me to look ridiculous. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I'd look ridiculous. What did Matt say? I must say. He basically said, I said, did you get better over the season? He says, no, I was born to do it. Oh, that is such an MS answer. So smug. <laughs> So smug. So smug I love I was, him. I was born to it, darling. Born to it, darling. <laughs> so I've been asking everybody today, like we, do, there's really no good or evil in this show. No. Who, in your opinion, though, in your personal opinion, is the most evil and the most good in season one? I, I think Rhaenyra is the most good, um, and I think the most evil. Ooh. May, yeah, re- yeah, Matt, Matt, Matt Smith. Actually, yeah. Not M- Matt Smith, not the character. <laughs> sorry, no. <laughs> no, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Damon Targaryen. Damon, Damon Matt Damon Smith Targaryen. Is, a, is a lovely man. Uh, 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 Damon Targaryen, yeah. And uh, <laughs> David's character. <laughs> David Horovich. Oh my god, I take it back. He, David he Horovich is no the best wrong. character ever. What? David Horovich, is, I love him. I think about him all the time. Oh we're, on, we're on a group text about insomnia. Me and, me and David. I've texted him almost serious? every single day for the last six months. I swear, I swear to God. Oh God. Um, Does the cast have group texts? We have some group texts. Do you? Yeah, Tell we have some group that. chats. Uh, well, we can't, we, we can't, can't. We can't we spread can't. anything about There are a few group chats. One started that was a disaster. It started <laughs> at the beginning and it lasted maybe three days. And then there's another one that I'm on. It was very popular. That's not true. true. Um, yes. Yes, we have. I can't share. It's just the us complaining. It's us complaining. It's, it's, us, it's complaining. us or someone going like, "Do you know what the crafties have got on? Does anyone know? <laughs> does anyone know if there are burritos at crafties? <laughs> what is this movie yeah, today? Yeah, yeah. What is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why does my rice look like that? <laughs> <laughs> Were there burritos back then? Yeah. Um, will a burrito make its way onto set? Yeah, I mean, that's those a are reference. the reference. Those are the know. kind of questions. <laughs> um, Jakar, you had to see sort of the the famous line yeah. of Jakaris in episode one. Yeah. Sort of how epic was that? For I mean, it was burrito? pretty. It was pretty epic. I remember reading it and being like. Like, yes. there's the line. Um, and yeah, I mean, she doesn't want to say it in the scene that she that she has to say it, which is kind of what is so heartbreaking about it. But no, I feel very like, it was very surreal to say such an iconic line in such an iconic context. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Can you tease? I mean, this, I sort of know because of the books. I know a little bit about this relationship yeah. that sort of starts to unfold. Can you tease a little bit about? We can, we can, we, we, have we, we can show you, we can show you. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Chris and Carl. Renee, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. That's it? That's it. That's all we have. That's, that's, that's what it is. That's, that's it. kind of perfect. That's all we have. Yeah, I think it's good, yeah. Renee's succession will be challenged. Knives will come out. You are the king. Your first duty is to take a new wife. So let's talk about this power couple on the show. Are you two the biggest power couple? Yes. Yes. Why? Wow. <laughs> um, so uh, we're badass. We're badass. We're the richest, um, um, sh- and she's incredibly smart, incredibly politically astute. And when he's, you know, got his sense around him, he listens to her. I think the thing about us as well is that we're probably the two people in the court. Well, and the, uh, I suppose Damon as well, because he's a he's a sort of live wire, and nobody quite. Mm. Damon, know, yeah. His sort of dynamite, but. I, Nobody wants to mess with us. Mm. Oh, I love that. Yeah. We, I want to. Yeah, because so no, we, no, no, we also control the navy, because we are seafarers, and so the realm's navy is basically our navy. Mm. So yeah, and we don't really care. 
how people think about us. Interesting. I, I find it interesting because you were, of course, I don't even want to say it, but the queen that never was. And then you're also the wealthiest. You've traveled the most. You're the most worldly. So how did the two of you recon reconcile not being at the top? I yeah, don't know that they have. They don't think they have reconciled. No, I don't think he certainly hasn't. And I don't think she has either. I think she's way better at covering it because she's such a good politician. She's superb at appearing that everything's okay. Mm. Whereas um, he, he's whereas not he's so, done so much. much. <laughs> he's just like, no, yeah. shut me up! You know. Um, so I don't know that they. I, I love that. Yeah, me I too. I actually quite like that about him. That yeah. he's so. Uh, he's so macho. Macho and so and so, <laughs> taking on the the the, yeah. the insult to his wife. Oh, that's he's, great. I, he's feel very, about, yeah. I feel very protected by you. Yes, yeah. you should. Yeah. So I'm not sure that they have reconciled. But yes, no, no reconciliation. Yeah. It's so I think, bubbling underneath. Yeah, and I think yeah. an, an awful lot of the motivation for the the season is him trying to find ways to get them. Yeah. Either to the top or better access to the top. And I think and the journey that they both go on is quite interesting. It's like they end up slightly in the opposite places yes. that they yeah. to begin with in a way. Yeah. I want to talk about this delicious line that you get to say yeah. that is in the trailer, so I'm not spoiling anything, but men would sooner put the realm to the torch than see a woman ascend the Iron Throne. How delicious yeah. was it to say it? Such great dialogue, it's but okay. it's also foreshadowing. A lot. Yeah, I mean, I was hooked into the show when I first met Ryan and Miguel, and Miguel said, um, uh, you know, the, the whole sort of arc of this, story, of this particular story is based around this line, which is that men would sooner put the realm to the torch than see a woman ascend the Iron Throne, and it's like, that, that is where we start, and that is where the journey, the whole of this story is about that fact and the unraveling of this ancient, patriarchal, really pretty corrupt, um, dysfunctional system, which weirdly is not that Dissimilar far from <laughs> to where we are today. Where we are now. George said in one of the panels that he did that there is no character that's really good or evil as opposed yeah. to Game of Thrones. That this one, there's a lot of gray area with these characters. Mm. But in your personal opinion, who is the most evil and the most good in season one? Oh, oh wow. My God. I think answering who's the most good might be a easier question <laughs> than who's bad. I think, you know, I think who's the most sort of good, mm. good in inverted commas, but it would be Pissarra? I would say Pissarra. Oh, of course, yeah. I was actually going to say Rhaenyra, but you're right, Viserys. I would probably. say, though, Rhaenyra's very much, very high, so she's very low is down in terms of Okay, moral. so Viserys is, yeah, but In terms of most who's good. like a good guy, a he's good guy. Just, he's just an innocent who found himself in the wrong situation. Yeah, it feel, yes, it feels like but, he's a sort of, oh, do you know, he's an innocent. Hightower, Reese. He's the most evil. Most evil. He's the one plotting. Oh, yeah. Otto Hightower. He's a nasty piece of work. Yeah, yeah, he's the one. Yeah, yeah, get him. <laughs> Splintering shields and ringing swords. And I placed my heir upon the Iron Throne. Your credits and the amount of projects that you've done between The Witcher, between Outlander, the voice of Loki, over 100 credits as an actor, I think around 135. So where does this show fit in the pantheon oh. of your career? Yeah, no, well, um, this, oh, this is a fantastic show. Yeah, I mean, I've, I was a huge fan of the original. Um, I knew Ryan Condal from two previous shows that we've worked on together. And uh, we were both very keen to work together again. And we used to have lunch and, and actually talk about this. It, when it was not guaranteed at all, not greenlit, um, you know, there were a number of shows competing for the same spot. And, uh, and we both had this wonderful kind of ambition to be able to see this come to fruition. And it is one, it's fabulous, uh, especially for Ryan, but uh, for me as well, to actually be a part of something that I've long wanted to be a part of. Okay, so because you were sort of there at, at its inception, what about Ryan's vision and his ability to lead do you think made George R. R. Martin sort of name him the, him the successor to the Game of Thrones kingdom? Because he's kind of like the appointed king by George yeah, R. R. Martin. I know. I mean, I don't know if Ryan's told you this. Uh, I'd, I'd hate to be sort of speaking out of turn, but um, when we were doing a, pit, uh, a pilot in New Mexico, we were in Santa Fe, and of course George lives around there, and uh, Ryan 
and I love this about Ryan, he, massive fan. And he basically um, pursued George and said, you know, it'd be really great to sit down and have lunch. And they just became friends and uh, became very, very sort of involved with each other and creatively. And, uh, and, and here we have the result. And I just think that's the most wonderful story. That was nine years ago that that happened. Wow. And so from that moment to this, this wonderful full experience that we're now having um, is, is down to that. And I think that's a great story. So your character had served King Jaehaerys and King Viserys. Did you sort of delve into the backstory and who do you think is the better leader between the two of them? Well, um, much as I love Viserys, I think his predecessor was probably, I mean, the problem is, I mean, it's very difficult. He, he, ha, he has a very, very difficult role. I mean, not Paddy, but Viserys. And Paddy. He has, very, he, he has a very, well, Paddy has a difficult role too, too. But, <laughs> um, you know, in all sorts of ways, but, uh, but Viserys, um, the way he even became king already placed him on a path of conflict really and and that's what's so wonderful about the world that George created and the world that Ryan and Miguel are creating with the show is that these are these are kind of, these have echoes in real history these people that came to power somewhat reluctantly somewhat by accident tried to do their best tried to do the right thing and then there were these other forces at work that were trying to undermine them or trying to what they believed was uh, do the right thing and you know so much of history is littered by people who felt they were doing the right thing and were really doing the wrong thing and so yeah this fits really well into that and we have the bonus of dragons of course well i'm going to add one more contest into the equation who do you think better natural born leader king viserys or jamie frazier from <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the king of men um natural born leader goodness me that's a look you know jamie fraser doesn't have to deal with dragons so you know come on give the guy a break the serious is he's got a lot on his plate i mean jamie's just got the american war of independence so it's it's nothing compared with what Viserys has to deal with. So I, I think Viserys is doing really well. And I would say that because I'm Lord Commander of the King's Guard. Yeah. And as commander, I mean, it seems like this is a show of ambition as well. There's There are people that don't start out ambition, ambitious and then they become ambitious and maybe it corrupts them, it corrupts their heart. Where do you fall in the line of this? Where does your character, because yours seems sort of the most selfless in a way from the get-go, but I don't know where it goes because I haven't read the book. I am, uh, well, I'm a morally upright individual, yes, I am, uh, which is an unusual step for me in my career. And he, <laughs> he's, he's just somebody that um, sees things very simply and also uh, occupies uh, a place in what is almost like a pseudo-religious order, the King's Guard, sort of reminiscent of the Knights Templar, you know, he, he abandons all kind of worldly delights you know there's no relationships for harold there's there's no money there's nothing there's just the targaryens no no chair probably no bed he's just devoted to them so he's a very um straight guy and uh and he has his opinions about everybody but he tries his very best to keep those opinions to himself just before i let you go at the start of season one who mm. do you think is the rightful heir to the throne Oh, I think Rhaenyra, yeah, definitely. Rhaenyra? Definitely, I do. I believe that she's the right choice, yes. Wow. I, I, I endorse this message. 